start recording. Mm -hmm. And good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to wait a little while for others to come on. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, we're almost live on Facebook. Okay. Uh-oh. Okay. We are not live. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. We're just going to wait a little bit for others to join. Thank you for joining us this morning, this afternoon, and this evening. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Do you actually need to let people in? Is, is it automatic? Yes, I, I need to okay. admit. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm keeping an eye on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. We'll begin shortly. Thank you. And we have a few more guests coming on and we'll start shortly. Okay. Doctor, I have one. Should we begin? As you wish. Okay, I think we'll begin. Okay. okay. Thank you. And I'll keep an eye on that. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Philip Roth Personal Library February Book Club. The, person, the Philip Roth Personal Library is located at the Newark Public Library, 5 Washington Street, here in downtown Newark, New Jersey. We are delighted to present Dr. Martina Brewa 
for a dialogue about the Prague orgy, orgy, a 1985 Philip Roth novel. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Dale Colson. I'm the Assistant Director for Special Collections here at the Newark Public Library. On behalf of our Library Director, Christian Zabriskie, and Board of Trustees President, Dr. Lauren Wells, we thank you all for joining us today. And during this time of uncertainty, we wish for you, your family and friends to be safe and well. We gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homeland we gather. We would like to acknowledge the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Muncie Lenape First Nations on, on which we are learning, laboring and organizing today. If you participated in one of our Philip Roth personal library virtual book clubs in the past, you may be surprised to see me. Please know that my friend and colleague, Nadine Hiron, is no longer with the North Public Library. We miss her dearly and wish her all the best in all of her future endeavors. I had a chance to speak with Dr. Briwa this week, and this book club will be run a bit differently than others in the past. After Dr. Briwa has concluded her presentation, we will allow those of you who, who would like to, to speak and be seen on camera, to speak and be and give a more personal and interactive uh, experience today. Dr. Briwa and I thank you in advance for your respectfulness and thoughtfulness and kindness toward fellow participants. Thank you. Now, please let me introduce today's host. Martina Briwa has an MA in English Philology from the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland, and a PhD in English Studies from the University of Malaga in Spain, where she works as an assistant professor. Her research interests include literary representations of East Central Europe and the construction of selfhood and otherness in multicultural contexts. She has published articles and book chapters on Philip Roth, John Updike, John Updike and Gary Steingart. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Martina Briwa. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure and a privilege for me to be here. Uh, thank you to Philip Roth Personal Library, to the Newark Public Library. Uh, thank you to Nadine Hirong, who uh, first reached out to me to invite me to be part of this book club. And thank you so much, Dale, for this very kind introduction and for chairing this session. So what I would like to just please let me uh, minimize my own view so that I don't get to see myself and don't get distracted <laughs> by that. Um, so what I would like to do today is, first of all, um, situate the Prague orgy within Philip Roth's body of work. And then I would like to provide you with some context in which this work was created. Uh, I believe this is quite important and can greatly enrich our reading of the novella. Now, so let's start um, with, oh, just give me a moment. I'm trying to move this. Okay, great. Um, okay. All right, great. Uh, so what you can see here, by the way, I forgot to say that um, it is a privilege for me to discuss the Prague, or the Prague orgy with you because uh, it's, it's one of my favorite Philip Roth novels if not the favorite one. And I have a special personal collect, uh, connection to this novella. Um, it's, it's the book that um, in many ways um, started my academic career, my academic path, and especially my research into uh, the meanings and representations of the mental category of uh, Eastern Europe. If you're interested in that, I'm going to be uh, very happy to discuss it later on. But back to uh, Philip Roth's uh, body of work. So if you look at this timeline, you can see that uh, the Prague Orgy was published in 1985 as the last book in in the Zuckerman book series. So we have um, The Ghostwriter in 1979. Uh, that's the book that you discussed with Professor Ira Nadel in the introductory lecture to this book club. Then in 1981, we have Zuckerman Unbound. 1983 is The Anatomy Lesson and 1985, The Prague Orgy. If we look at the, I'm very sorry, but I'm trying to move this and it's not okay. 
I can see that I cannot use my arrows. I have to use my um, my my um, mouse pad. Okay, so I'll try to do that. Uh, anyway, if you look at this edition, uh, this is Library of America edition of Zuckerman Bound. You can see that the Zuckerman book series uh, is published together with the epilogue, and the epilogue is the Prague Orgy. Now, the question arises, should we treat uh, the Prague Orgy as a self-standing work, or should we read it as part of the Zuckerman book series, Zuckerman Bound? I personally believe that both approaches are correct and both make sense, and I have used both in my own academic work. Uh, so I have discussed the Prague Orgy um, alongside, for example, the Professor of Desire, focusing on the role and meanings of Prague. Uh, but I have also situated it within Zuckerman Bound. And by doing that, I was able to see that uh, the Prague Orgy reflects that ultimate attempt um, by Zuckerman to redeem himself in the eyes of his critics. So, as I said, both approaches uh, render interesting insights. Now, I have presented you with this timeline. Uh, but uh, I'd like to problematize this for you just a little bit. So the Prague Orgy was published in 1985 as the epilogue to the Zuckerman book series. Now, the novella was first drafted in 1968, and it is set in 1976. And the Roth himself admitted that for him, uh, this novella was the seed from which the whole Zuckerman book series sprang. The Prague Orgy is inspired by Roth's trips to Czechoslovakia that he took from 1972 until 1977. In 1977, he was denied the visa to travel there because of his contacts with the proscribed Czech authors. The first trip that Roth took to Czechoslovakia was in 1972 with his then girlfriend, Barbara Sproul. And you may recognize Barbara Sproul as the model for Claire Ovington in The Professor of Desire and The Breast. Uh, she is David Kapish's girlfriend. And the original purpose behind this first trip in 1972 was to see the city of Kafka. And let me quote from Roth's essay, In Search of Kafka and Other Answers. Says Roth, it is Franz Kafka who was responsible for getting me to Prague to begin with. I began reading Kafka seriously in my early 30s, at a time, in other words, when I was unusually sensitized to Kafka's tales of spiritual disorientation and obstructed energies. And as you know, Kafka is a big influence on Philip Roth. Um, Later on, I'm going to briefly talk about some of the works that were inspired and feature this important literary figure. Now, Roth was looking to see the city of Kafka. He wanted to see the city of Kafka. However, according to Czech writer and Roth's good friend Milan Kundera, what he found in Prague was, and let me quote from Kundera now, Kafka forbidden in a country whose culture had been massacred by the Russian occupation. So the year is 1972 and Prague is undergoing the so-called normalization. Normalization followed the Prague Spring. The Prague Spring was a reform movement which started back in the 1960s and aimed at liberalization of social, political and cultural life under communism. This was a reform movement that originated within the Communist Party itself, but it aimed at transforming the existing system into a more pro-citizen system, into socialism with a human face. But as you can imagine, this reform movement, with its liberalization of social, political and cultural life, did not go down well with the Soviet authorities, and they decided to violently suppress this reform movement. So that happened in August of 1968, when the Warsaw Pact troops, that is the Soviet troops and the troops of other Eastern Bloc countries, rumbled into Czechoslovakia and occupied the country within hours. What followed was normalization. This is a rather cynical term to refer to a period of hardline communism, during which power was returned to the communist old guard, 
reforms were canceled. Censorship was reinstalled with a vengeance. And the writers involved in the Prague Spring were banned from publishing and forced to take up menial jobs. Some of them decided to emigrate, like, for example, Milan Kundera, who in 1975 emigrated to France. So this is the cultural context that Roth encountered in Prague when he first traveled there in 1972. Through his translators, he came into contact with the proscribed authors. And he soon realized that even though they were not able to publish officially, they were banned from their jobs, uh, what they were able to do and what they did was to create art beyond official channels of communication. They created a counterculture. They published through Samizdat, which consisted in laboriously copying manuscripts and then distributing them, and in Tamizdat, which consisted in smuggling uh, the manuscripts abroad and publishing them abroad legally. So Roth was fascinated by what he found. He was fascinated by the counter culture and he wanted to know more. So when he came back to the US, he sought the company of Czech emigres. He attended classes on Czech history, literature and film. And he wanted to help the Czech authors financially. So what he did was to set up um, uh, the so-called ad hoc check fund. That was basically a bank account to which Roth and other 14 American writers contributed uh, between uh, 50 and $100 a month. This money was then um, exchanged for coupons that were transferred behind the Iron Curtain. He also wrote a special country report for the pen and he wrote that anonymously because he did not want to endanger the, the, the authors, the writers in question. In this report, uh, he detailed the repression of the authors. Roth continued visiting Czechoslovakia and he made friends with Ivan Klima and Milan Kundera, among others. During this period, he also published works that were very much influenced by the figure of Kafka. Um, first of all, looking at Kafka, which is a story that uh, reimagines Kafka's life beyond Bohemia. He actually uh, reimagines his life in Newark. Um, and Kafka also looms large in the breast from 1972, which is, of course, uh, inspired by Kafka's metamorphosis with the difference that um, you know, um, David Kippersh transforms into giant mammary gland instead of a cockroach. And, and especially I would say the Professor of Desire, which takes part in, in Prague among others. Uh, but perhaps the most, um, let's say, far reaching and culturally significant um, contribution to Roth uh, was the book series known as Writers from the Other Europe. This was a book series of which Roth became the general editor and it was published by Penguin and it featured authors from Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary and Yugoslavia. Um, among the featured authors, uh, there was, for example, my personal favorite Bruno Schulz. I hope we can come back to Bruno Schulz because his life or rather his death provides a very important intertext in the Prague orgy. I also would like to um, draw your attention to the name itself, writers from the other Europe. Uh, some found this name quite contentious and I'd like to point out that all the 17 authors published within this series are men. There is no female author, which I believe uh, gives an additional meaning to the name um, other. But again, if you're interested in that, I'm, I'm happy to uh, come back to it in the Q&A um, session. Now, in this um, last, I'd say more theoretical uh, slide, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, the influence that Prague and the other Europe uh, exerted on Roth. And I have listed here several views, several critical views. I personally believe uh, that this period of engagement with Prague and the literary cultures of uh, East Central Europe served as a kind of laboratory of uh, Roth's creative energies. Perhaps that's why uh, Claudia Raff-Pierre-Pont says that in Prague, Roth found 
another living moral subject, complete with historical weight, threats of exposure, and difficult claims of loyalty. This sounds just like uh, the stuff that we that we find in uh, in Roth's novels, don't we? Right, his his favorite stuff. Mark Schachner speaks of a Europeanization of outlook and deepening of his fascination with the intractable, the perverse, and the unattainable. And indeed, these qualities lie at the center of many of his later works. Um, if you think about uh, Roth's interest, you know, he's never a lukewarm writer. He's always fascinated by the extreme. He's interested in trauma. So what could be a better subject for Roth than this entanglement between politics and culture, art created under totalitarianism, uh, a counter culture that the repression that the writer suffered bred. And this comment about a Europeanization of outlook is quite important, I believe, especially if we remember the criticism that Roth received from Irving Ho. Uh, Ho said that Roth, um, Roth's personal culture was thin. He accused him of having thin personal culture. Um, Roth's travels to Prague, his engagement with Prague and East Central Europe in general, expanded his personal culture um, and provided him uh, with education in his own uh, Jewish literary legacy. Hannah Wirth uh, Nesher uh, seems to understand it very well when she says that this movement from Newark to Prague was a turning point, uh, but not just for Roth, but also for Jewish American literature, marking the passage from a literature of immigration and assimilation into a literature of retrieval of the desire to be part of a Jewish literary legacy. If we think about the Prague Orgy, this is a novella about trying to retrieve unpublished manuscripts written by a Jewish author murdered by the Nazis. Um, so this is a novella of retrieval, of recovering, of saving a literary forefather from oblivion, even if this is Sisovsky's rather than Zuckerman's father. And I believe that for Zuckerman, this is also a mission meant at inscribing himself um, within that Jewish literary legacy, within world literature at large. And for me, um, even more than a movement from America to Europe, this is a kind of a cultural continuum uh, where Europe and America are merged and where both enrich each other. So it's not that you know, culture flows from one space to the other. It's a continuous movement. It's an ongoing cultural exchange. And finally, uh, David Gubler says that uh, this engagement with Prague and the other Europe, um, also, and also uh, the fiction that Prague inspired was the catalyst for the direction that Roth's career would next take. And I agree with this statement because I believe that thanks to Prague, Roth gained the necessary distance to explore his own favorite subject better. Uh, that is America in all its complexity, uh, the way he does it, for example, in the American pastoral. Now, I think this is all that I would like to say um, as far as the context is concerned. So I'd like to move to um, the novella itself and briefly remind you of the plot and how the novella is structured. And I think that we could move to some questions perhaps. So in this slide, which I titled The Prague Orgy as the Jamesian Quest um, into the heart of the other Europe, I have listed the main characters. And this, um, this headline, this, this title, The Prague Orgy as the Jamesian Quest, is of course um, a reference to what Harold Bloom said. Harold Bloom was the first to notice that the Prague Orgy echoes the plot of Henry James's The Aspern Papers. So 
What happens in the Prague orgy? Well, we have Nathan Zuckerman, who is the first person narrator. And we learn, if we open the very first page of the Prague orgy, that we learn that this, is, this comes from Zuckerman's notebooks. So Nathan Zuckerman uh, has already published his contentious uh, bestseller, Karnofsky, which, as we know, is Portnoy's complaint in thin disguise. And he's visited in his New York apartment by one Zdenek Sisovsky, who is a Czech emigre, a proscribed author, who was banned from publishing by the communist authorities because he published a satire that endangered them, uh, that, uh, sorry, enraged them, rather, and, uh, and endangered um, himself. And he is accompanied by Eva Kalinova. Eva Kalinova is a great Chekhovian actress, the greatest Chekhovian actress of all Prague. But she herself um, has also been degraded. Um, however, uh, not so much for, yes, for political reasons, but also for ethnic reasons, for starting a relationship with a Jewish man uh, treated by the authorities as a Zionist agent. So we have this element of anti-Semitism there as well. Uh, so uh, Zdenek comes to uh, Nathan Zuckerman because uh, he admires his work. However, there is an additional purpose. Um, there is a um, quite important uh, second purpose behind this visit. And that is because what Zdenek Sisovsky wants from Zuckerman is to make Zuckerman go to Prague and retrieve the unpublished stories of Sisovsky's father murdered by the Nazis. These stories are said to be superb. They are, uh, they are said to be written in in the Yiddish of Flaubert. However, Sisovsky cannot retrieve them himself uh, because um, first of all, he cannot go back to Prague. And second, the stories are in possession of his ex-wife, Olga Sisovska, uh, who is mad at Sisovsky for his many infidelities and most of all, his relationship with Eva Kalinova. Now, we also have Rudolf Bolotka, uh, who becomes um, the principal reality instructor in Prague for Nathan Zuckerman. And if some critics believe that Zdenek Sisovsky is modeled on Milan Kundera, others say that Rudolf Bolotka is modeled on Ivan Klima. From what I know, uh, these characters are a mixture of different characters, uh, sorry, of different real life authors and intellectuals, including Kundera and Klima. And finally, we have the culture minister Novak, who is the one who throws Zuckerman out of Czechoslovakia. So that's the plot, that's the situation. And in this last slide that I would like to share with you, um, I have um, listed some of the main threads uh, that run through the Prague orgy. Uh, and I think that they may serve as, uh, as a kind of departure point for our discussion, but I'm also open to your insights, your um, impressions and observations about this um, very slim, but I believe a very um, interesting novella. Thank you so much. Thank you, doctor, and, and guests, feel free to uh, come on camera if you like. We have a comment in the chat, and you can communicate in whatever method you feel most comfortable. So thank you, and uh, let's have a good discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to see Professor Ira Nadel, whose um, book, Account Further Broad Counter Life, um, was a great source for preparing this presentation and a great source of many very interesting insights, the archives, the letters, the communication between Kundera and, and um, Philip Roth. Thank you very much for that. It was a, it's a great book. Thank you. Um, should we start with the question that's in the chat? Um, Rick says, I would like to hear a discussion comparing the anti-communism of the Prague orgy to I Married a Communist. I Married a Communist was not pro-communist, but was definitely not anti-communist. I'm asking as the son of a man 
who was called before the HUAC. My mother told me that she was disappointed that Roth killed off her friend Zelda. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, so let me think about the anti-communism of, um, of the Prague orgy. Um, first of all, uh, you know, among these ideas, among these threats that I have listed here, I have listed um, the dangers of preconceptions. Um, I believe that in many ways, the Prague orgy is a novella about the dangers of preconceptions um, because uh, Zuckerman comes to Prague equipped with a set of ideas of what it is like to live under communism, um, about the suffering and the oppression that um, the writers are going through. And while the oppression was undeniable, uh, that's why I, um, I wanted to share the context behind this novella with you. Um, Zuckerman uh, finds out that um, perhaps the reality is not the way he imagined it. When the novel starts, when he comes to, when Zuckerman comes, arrives in Prague, uh, the first place that Roth takes us to is an orgy, right? It's not a meeting, it's not a Sam is that party, as Timothy Garton Ash would say but it's an orgy. Granted, it's not a terribly scandalous orgy, or at least it's not as scandalous as the Czech hosts promise it to be, but it's an orgy nevertheless. And Zuckerman finds himself uh, to be quite shocked by the whole affair. Um, he, the author of Kurnowski, is shocked that the Czech authors are not suffering as much as he expected them to suffer. And he has to um, rethink his preconceptions about himself and the place. I believe that Philip Roth uh, was uh, very much against uh, the measures introduced by the communist system, the measures which oppressed the authors that became his friends, uh, to whom he became very close. But I believe that uh, this novella is only partly political. Um, I think that what Roth wanted to do, or wanted for us to perceive, is a kind of comparison between life under totalitarianism and life um, under democracy, and perhaps counterintuitively show us that in both contexts, there may be some kind of oppression and some kind of censorship. So please do not get me wrong. I think that he was uh, very strongly opposed to what was going on uh, behind the Iron Curtain. But I think that uh, denouncing communism as such is not the main purpose behind uh, the Prague orgy. But I'm, I would like to hear from you. I would like to think, what do you think about it? Uh, John, yes, I think I... Hi, can you, do you mind unmuting yourself? So I can't hear you, I'm so sorry. Can I Can I read you in the chat? I have uh, reached out to our tech support and see if we can um, rectify that. I appreciate your patience, thank you. And Rick, I, I hope that I managed to answer uh, your question about uh, um, right wh whether uh, we should treat the, the Prague orgy 
uh, whether the pragogy expresses a an anti-communist uh, stance as, as i said i believe this is uh, this is definitely not the the main as i read it this is not the main point of of this novella uh, can can you hear me now yes yes great thank you wonderful thank you so much for this fabulous presentation thank you so much thank you for being here I, I'm, I am an English professor and a writer, uh, and I host a TV show on education, art, and social change. I became a Philip Roth fan in my 30s uh, at the time when I discovered Kafka. So it's interesting that both of those, you know, in my life were together. Um, I, I'm curious about, in terms of the Europeanization aspect, the particular moment we're in in America now uh, feels like a dumbing down moment like on steroids, on steroids, you know? Uh, and I think it's, you know, just, you know, we, we've, we've become such a market-based economy, especially in this country. We're turning away from culture, away from literature. Less and less people know who Philip Roth even is, you know? And yet, you know, from your talk today, I'm realizing he matters more than ever. And as truly the great American novelist of our time, or certainly one of them, uh, who needs to be known more broadly. But you really brought that home with this political connection in terms of authoritarianism, in terms of what was happening in Eastern Europe, what's happening in the world right now, right here in America, you know, this silencing of culture. Uh, and so I've never read the Par Prague Orgy, but I would, I can't, it's gonna be the next book that I read, okay, uh, with your wonderful guidance here that you provided with us. But on another note, I would love to hear from other people in terms of personal reactions to the text. Mm -hmm. As an English professor, I come out of the reader's response theory. I don't know if people are aware of reader's response, which has to do with what the people think, what the reader actually thinks in terms of you know thoughts and feelings and reactions and all that. And so the meaning is not just in the text and it's not just what the writer felt, but it's also us as people. So in terms of a book club, it would be great to democratize, I think, this club and hear from all the voices here. Like, what are your reactions to this, to what we learned today? That's personally what I would love also. But thank you so much for your work. And I mean, this could go on for hours to hear all the beautiful, com complex reactions that we all have to this marvelous writer and, 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 and your analysis. Uh, uh, Martina. How do you say your name? Uh, Martina. Martina. Thank you, Martina. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's a, that's a great comment. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm, I'm very much interested in uh, what you think about this uh, novella. What are your reactions? Uh, uh, to be honest, uh, I've only ever discussed this novella in a more academic context. And I really want to know what readers think, readers that perhaps do not apply, um, you know, those... Um, methodological uh, tools that that we as um you know as people in the academia do i have a couple of comments may i yes yeah. of course i'd love to hear them yeah well i'm also an english professor uh, and a political person and i i see this book uh, as being about literature primarily, uh, although set against a political background. And I'm really interested to learn uh, what an activist Philip Roth was. Um, but I had two literary things to say about it in terms of my response. Um, one, I mean, obviously, there's the echoes of Bruno Schultz. That's not what I wanted to uh, talk about. But um, Cynthia Ozick, has, who's a wonderful American uh, Jewish writer, has a fabulous story called Envy or Yiddish in America, uh, which was published in Commentary Magazine in 1969. And it's about an author uh, very like this character, this Czechoslovakian writer, who he's a brilliant, absolutely brilliant writer in Yiddish. But he can't find a translator. And this is his agony that he looks and looks and he's being driven crazy by not being able to find a translator. And there's another Yiddish writer who has found a translator and who has become vastly successful. So that's the envy 
part. And I, I felt that that story must be in the background of, um, of Roth's novella too, because it's so much dealing with the question of accessibility and you know this great, great Yiddish writer who can't be, can't get an audience for different reasons. The other um, connection that I found was pure chance. In another book club that I belong to, we read a novel by uh, Trollope, Anthony Trollope. It's called Nina Balatka. And so I was struck by the name of one of the characters, Balatka, which is very unusual. Um, but the Trollope novel written, you know, around uh, 1855 or 65, something like that, I think in the 1850s, it's also set in Prague. And it's about Jewish Christian relations in Prague. And so there's a, a, a tremendous amount of thematic connection. And I felt that um, Roth had done a tip of the hat to that novel by taking the name Nina Balatka, Balatka, anyway. So those were my reader responses. Thank you so much. I, I didn't realize that. I definitely am going to, to check this novel out. Thank you for, for mentioning it. Um, yes, and about Ozik, I think Roth was actually the one who introduced um, Ozik to uh, Bruno Schultz. And later on, as we know, um, Bruno Schulz inspired uh, her own novel. Um, so yeah, uh, fantastic connections. And I think that this this whole you know tissue of intertextuality yes. is much thicker than we may uh, perhaps realize. Totally. It, Right, because there's, there's, of course, Henry James, uh, there's Bruno Schultz. Uh, I don't know if the, um, if the readers here um, are familiar with uh, how, um, how Roth reworks uh, that motif from Schultz's life, or rather his tragic death, his tragic demise. Um, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure you do. I don't know about other readers, so just very quickly, I'd, I'd like to say that um, Bruno Schultz was a Polish Jewish writer uh, who was um, murdered by, by the Nazis um, in a similar way um, in which Sosowski's father is murdered uh, or, or his story is told in the Prague orgy. Uh, so uh, the story goes in this way that um, he was uh, protected by a Gestapo office officer um, and um, there was another Jewish person living in the same town, in the same village, who is protected by yet another um, Gestapo officer. And um, they uh, they argued, they had a very, uh, very rough fight. And as a result, he said, and as horrible as as this sound, uh, he, uh, one of the officers uh, said, you know, um, shot um, uh, the, the Jew that was under the other's protection. And um, the reaction of the other officer was uh, so, Oh God, I think something happened. <laughs> so, some, I'm sorry, something happened with the screen. Yes, you, it looks like Ira. Hi, Ira. It looks like you started screen sharing. So. <laughs> okay, I <myself>. Hi, Ira. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Nice to see you. I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. Fine. He'll okay. fix that up in a second. Thank you. Don't worry. So okay. anyway, basically, the uh, the line uh, was, uh, you know, you, you shot my Jew, uh, so um, I shot yours. And this is uh, what apparently happened to Bruno Schulz. And this uh, tragic story is appropriated by um, Zdenek Sisovsky, appropriated because uh, we learned that uh, the story may not be true, right? Talking about going back to this idea of preconceived notions, preconceived ideas, uh, it is Olga Sisovska that reveals to Zuckerman that in fact, Sisovsky's father uh, spent um, most of, uh, um, of the war uh, hiding in his Gentile friend's uh, bathroom. Um, so this is the, uh, this is the um, Bruno Schulz intertext. And of course, uh, the whole um, story of the retrieval of the manuscripts brings to mind the retrieval or the search for the um, manuscript of Bruno Schulz. Cynthia Ozick talks about, oh, this is the subject of, uh, of her 
uh, of her novel, inspired by uh, Bruno Schulz's story that Roth had introduced her to. Could I just wanted to say one political thing? There, there is. Um, at one point, uh, somebody says this, which I think is really interesting given today's situation. He says, you Americans think in terms of one year or two. Russians think in centuries. They know instinctively that they live in a long time and that the time is theirs. They know it deeply and they are right. I, I think that's a very interesting and profound thing to uh, think about given uh, Russia today. I was also struck by this by this sentence when rereading the Prague orgy for, for this book club. Yes, thank you for bringing this up. Mm -hmm. I do think that this is a, this is a significant sentence given uh, the political context these days. Yes. Okay, looks like Jim had his hand up. Jim, can you unmute? Let's see. Um, it, the, I'm just so sorry, it's the Messiah yeah. of Stockholm. Uh, the the novel by Cynthia Ozick. That Sorry. was the question from the chat. Thank you. I think we got it. Okay. Yes, there you yes, go. Now, now I can unmute. Okay. It's now part of my toolkit and skill set and all that. Um, since we have so many um, uh, English professors uh, on, on the call, I just happen to be um, starting next Tuesday uh, teaching the... Um, the Prague Orgy uh, to a class of um, mostly English majors in a course, course, course called the Literary Marketplace. Um, so I'd like any tips, any pedagogic tips um, about who, how to address the novel uh, with undergraduates from anybody out there. Where are you doing this? Um, at Muhlenberg College here in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I'm, of course, I'm going to repeat the name and I'm going to write it in the chat as well. Uh, it's the Messiah of Stockholm. That's the, that's the uh, question from the chat. And uh, Jim, if I, if I may um, start, um, I personally, I've, I've never taught the Pragorgia, I'd love to. I've only written about it. But uh, to me, uh, there are two uh, interconnected uh, threads. Um, one, is what I said before, this is a novella about preconceived ideas and the dangers of preconceived ideas to me. And the second one is, and as I said, they are interconnected to me. The second one is Prague as a, uh, as a Jewish city. Uh, because uh, the moment that uh, Roth uh, set his foot there, he realized that there was a connection between Prague and himself. And that connection is reflected in the novella. Um, so this is also part of this idea of preconceived notions, right? He found there something that he did not expect to find. Um, and perhaps my favorite part of the Prague orgy is that moment when he's walking the streets and when he is uh, remembering himself as a child when he was uh, collecting money for the Jewish National Fund. And he imagines that Prague could be that uh, city that Jews would buy if they collected enough money. So in this very moment, a kind of, um, let's say, transatlantic continuum is formed because we have that a Jewish Atlantis, we have that um, used Jewish city, um, a shabby city that little um, Zuckerman imagined as a child, and we have that communist Prague. So that's a beautiful moment to me. So as I said, for me, there are these two interconnected readings. The first one, Prague, uh, sorry, the Prague orgy as a novella about the dangers of preconceived ideas, but also a novella about the pleasures of uh, connecting with a city, uh, the pleasures of finding something unexpected in this city. This city turns out to be a familiar city for Zuckerman, and as we know, also for Roth. Thank you. 
Yeah, it is an idea that I stole from Ira a few years ago um, uh, from his book on, on Roth counter life. Um, and that had to do with the idea of Zuckerman and Roth himself as having, I forget Alan's, uh, Ira's exact phrase, um, and that was um, uh, that Roth had an obsession with rescuing. So we not only get the savior complex, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but also the ambassadors. Um, but I was also thinking about rescuing Anne Frank from both oblivion um, and death. And you mentioned looking at Kafka, where he feels guilty uh, for making fun of Dr. Kafka with all his friends. And then he feels so guilty that he has him over for dinner. And, you know, that that, that story, uh, you know, plays out as well. Um, so um, I'm wondering about sort of um, the idea of Roth slash Zuckerman, once he was established and had some influence, you know, then using that to become a kind of rescuer, both rescuing, you know, people, but also as a couple of people said, rescuing culture itself. Mm. Was Roth an older, oldest child? No, he was the youngest child. Oh, okay. two brothers, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was hoping yeah. Ira would, would weigh in here, but, you know, and he's the expert. Mm -hmm. Friends, I put a link to the Messiah of Stockholm in the chat. And also my friend Rick, who's not able to unmute, has a follow-up question. Doctor, you mentioned a film. Uh, do you know any history of the movie? Why was it created in Prague? Are you um, Do you mean the adaptation of the Prague orgy? I believe so, yes. Okay, yes, so there's an adaptation and this is a, right, because let, let me start from the beginning. I know that Roth um, created a TV uh, script, which um, which never, you know, this project never came into fruition. Um, this um, script is included in the Library of America edition of Zuckerman Bound, if I remember correctly, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, however, I believe, last year or a couple of years ago a um, Czech adaptation um, was um, was filmed um, and I watched it online and um, I don't know if there's anybody who has watched it I tried to yeah mm -hmm. how do you what do you think about it I have um, I have some strong but, thoughts about it I, I'm interested in you yeah yours. well I, I guess also because of the um you know I, obviously I had to go with the subtitles. Um, so that added another barrier, um, but it didn't uh, make much visual sense to me. Um, and, you know, I'm not a, a cineast, as they say, so maybe it was just above my kind of conceptual pay grade when it comes to, you know, um, art movies, as we call them. Right. So um, Rick says that that he watched it. Um, I'm, I'm really interested uh, in your in your opinion about it, it, to my mind, well, I actually liked it, even though I know that it received very bad reviews in, um, in the Czech Republic, apparently. I actually liked it. I like the character of, uh, of uh, Olga. Um, I like the character of Eva Kalinova too. Um, you know, recently I've, I've published this paper in which I look at Olga and Kalinova more closely than I used to. And in this paper in general, I think about the, uh, I reflect on the figure of male dissident as the dominant figure, you know, as the dominant lens through which we perceive East Central European opposition. And I think that again, with Olga and with um, Eva, uh, you know, Roth is maybe trying to make us rethink that stereotype. So I liked these two characters in the film adaptation. Uh, I do find Zuckerman to be a little bit too coy, a little bit too subdued for my character. I know that he is... Um, he is a force to revisit his preconceptions in Prague. Uh, but perhaps um, maybe he's a little bit too subdued in the film, for my taste. I wonder what Rick says. Let me let me uh, read. Right. Okay. Yes. Exactly. It's a it's a Czech production. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. I agree. I agree. <laughs> 
I'm also trying to read through the um through the chat comments. And there's a great comment from from John as well on on teaching um the Prague orgy. Yes, I totally agree that it would be great to use Kundera. Um I think it's uh, this is a novella. I don't know what what you think, but I think it's a novella that uh, also um, benefits from being read alongside the Professor of Desire. If you want to focus on on Prague more, um, can I just say something too? Um, nobody's actually talked about the orgy <laughs> side. Thank of you it. for bringing this up. Yes, let's and, talk about it. <laughs> I mean, just one thing about it. I mean, I have to confess, I've never been to an orgy. Um, I have a friend. Neither. <laughs> I have a friend in New York who went to lots of them. Uh, but I have to say, this orgy was not fun. It was. It was not. I mean, it was sexual in all the worst ways. You know. Mm -hmm. you didn't have the sense really of people of you know release and enjoyment and you know something uh, 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 something really orgiastic. I mean, it, people were expressing all of their worst social attitudes. Really, was what it was, and so I, I just wondered what other people thought about the orgy or what you think Philip Roth thought about the orgy or so on and so forth. I mean, I'm guessing he went to a few orgies in his life, but but one doesn't know. I mean, I don't know. Ira probably does, but not me. Ira, can you can you speak now? I you believe you may be unmuted. I don't know. Can I yes, can you I may. speak? There's Ira. Thank you, Ira. Let's hear okay. from Ira. Wonderful. Wonderful. This is great. Well, first of all, let me describe a Canadian orgy. I've been to many Canadian orgies, and it's people who are properly dressed, sharing tea. And we sit around and talk about what it would be like to go to an orgy, when in fact we are attending a Canadian orgy, but to go beyond orgies. This is a great presentation. Thank you, Martina. You, Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Yes, identified a lot of dimensions to uh, to the novella, which is frequently read quickly and dismissed, oh. and people kind of go past it. Let's get back to the ghostwriter, or let's move ahead. So one of my uh, questions is, how do you think the Prague orgy influenced the American trilogy? And particularly, did it allow, and you refer to it, you cite three or four people, um, Hannah and David and others, um, that it's a kind of turning point. Do you see it as opening a door on the American experience, American history, almost giving Roth permission to write about the Vietnam experience, to write about political correctness, to write about uh, race as he does in The Human Stain? I guess another way of asking this question, which would be upside down, if Roth had never gone to Prague and never had that experience, would he have written the same type of, and I'll use quotation marks, political novels, which we see in the American trilogy? Thank you very much for that. I think it's a difficult question. I mean, the last one that you ask, it's a difficult one. I, I don't know, um, but I am sure that uh, this uh, this whole experience, this whole engagement meant a lot and it did change, it did transform. I do, I do see it as a kind of transformative phase for Roth. Um, and particularly, and I'm, I'm coming back, I know it's, uh, I, I sound like a broken record, but this idea of preconceived notions to me is central to the novella. I do believe that he had his own preconceived ideas and they got debunked. Perhaps some of them got reinforced, but others got debunked. And I do believe that uh, this experience provided him with material uh, necessary to, um, how shall I put it, to carry out this transatlantic comparison, for example, on the question of censorship. 
you know, sometimes it, Roth has his spectacular moments, right? His time is that mentality moments, as Joseph Benethoff would, would put it, um, when he says that, you know, this is a country where nothing goes and everything matters, right? Yes, um, right. And America is the opposite. Um, yeah. But I do believe that he did notice certain mechanisms, uh, mechanism of repression, mechanisms of um, censorship. He was able to perceive them in America. He was able to um, see myths being debunked, like the American dream myth in the American pastoral. Mm -hmm. um, or the myth of racial purity in the human stain. So I definitely believe that those insights, and I think you, you speak about it in your book very well. Um, you know, we are talking here about things not being black and white, about those, as Claudia Roth-Pierpont very rightly puts, difficult claims of loyalty, about a really, you know, um, fuzzy um, borders. Um, so I think that this problematization that Roth is so interested in um, is due, at least in part, to, to that experience uh, behind the Iron Curtain and the kind of literature uh, I, that he was reading at the time. Yes, yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think there are connections perhaps with the plot against America that we could suddenly explore yes. between the two. And I think in Roth's uh, life, there are certain significant uh, touchstones, if you will. And certainly the trip to Prague, two trips was really quite remarkable, as was his meeting with Primo Levi. That was something which stayed with him really for the rest of his life. And of course, the death of Primo Levi was, um, had tremendous impact for him. And I think that we could, I don't like to do diagrams, but we could diagram five, six, seven key events, political, social, literary events uh, in Roth's life that would have almost like, a, if you picture a volcano, the event at the top, Primo Levi, and then everything which emerges mm -hmm. from that. And certainly the Prague, Kafka experiences interest is important, but the idea of the orgy is something we all have to think more about. That's why right. he should integrate that into the story. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to take that up a bit. Um, somebody said in the um, chat that the orgy wasn't fun was a big point of the book. And I, I agree, it's obvious that the orgy isn't fun, and that's a big point of the book. I want to mention a phrase out of the 60s, 70s, 80s, the literatures of sexual politics. Remember that? And in a way, you could look at this as the literatures of sexual politics and why he focuses on an orgy. He didn't have to focus on an orgy. It could have been any kind of event or, or um, episode. but. Sex is also a very important theme for Roth all the time. And um, maybe the fact that an orgy can't be fun in Prague is for somebody like him, one of the most cutting, uh, trenchant criticisms of the regime. I mean, it, it ruins people's personal lives. Um, how can you have fun when you know what you're going home to and what the environment is and who the person opposite you is? So I, I, I think that, yeah, I mean, if I were teaching it, I'd spend the first hour talking about Prague and the second hour talking about the orgy. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't the <laughs> orgy a strategy in itself? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, I think that there's some um, real life model, right? Uh, behind that uh, kind of um, encounter, that kind of meeting in Prague. Um, but what I do believe is that, uh, you know, remember when I said, I, I quoted from Timothy Garton Ash, who wrote a lot about the idea of uh, 
Eastern Europe as a um, you know as a as a mental category as a uh, not just a geopolitical concept but as a mental category you know the Eastern Bloc itself, and and he talks about you know this some is that party uh, where authors um, share the the latest uh, manuscripts. Um, and here in the Prague orgy, we would expect perhaps to visit such a gathering, a Samizdat party, that would be in line with our expectations, but Roth takes us uh, to an orgy instead, where some of our preconceptions and Zuckerman's preconceptions are debunked. Now, I do believe that this entanglement between politics, culture, and the erotic is uh, also Kundera's influence. And a kind of um, perhaps, uh, well, of course, the erotic is extremely important for Roth, but um, as I read the Prague Orgy, to me, there's also a little bit of uh, Kundera's influence there. Yeah. If th somebody in the chat asked about uh, the first draft, the information that I included in the slides uh, about how the Prague Orgy was first drafted in 1968. And I am going to ask Professor Nadel about that because this is the information I found in his book and also several other sources. I know this was drafted um, at that time and that was before, um, that, that was even before the Zuckerman series, that was before Ross first visit. Right, but that's 68, so the, the Prox Spring um, suppression happened. Uh, Rock must have known about that. Uh, so he must have been thinking about Prague already then. But uh, Professor, if, you, uh, if you're able to give us more context than that, I'm myself very interested. Well, um, I'd have to get back to you. <laughs> okay. I'd have to do a lot more research. However, Roth, remember, even in high school, spoke out against oppression. He led a kind of, I think he was in grade 13 or something, action against the repression of a black uh, uh, performer in uh, Independence Hall, I think in Washington, DC. He wanted to go into law. That was an early interest of his. And so his awareness probably through the news of uh, what was happening uh, with the so-called Prague Spring, I think would have um, more than stimulated him, provoked him into trying to write something about that whole experience, combined with his study of Kafka and his teaching of Kafka, I think he almost felt, and I think we could use this verb, almost felt compelled mm -hmm. to go and to do something, which is interestingly and importantly expressed through not just his writing, but the series, the writers from the other Europe which was something he took very seriously, committed a lot of time to, did some research in terms of finding an appropriate publisher and did find an editor who was keen to take that work uh, or that series. And as we know, it went on for a number of years. And that's a very important dimension of Roth, which again, sometimes can be downplayed. I think it's really critical. And any full account of the Prague orgy must also discuss the importance, the significance of that series, the writers from the other Europe. I totally agree, yeah, thank you. Oh, that's, um, I, I think that we have lots of interesting question. Um, I'm just looking at the, um, I'm, I'm, I've started from the end. Okay, orgy is an example of supreme openness, the opposite of the Prague political suppression. Yeah, I think that that's that's right. I mean, um, but again, yes and no, um, because uh, it's it's Olga, right? That says, I don't know, am, am I allowed to use swear words in this? If it's oh, a right quotation, yes, of course, yes, yes. Okay, so I think she says, and I, I can't remember the page, but but she says. Uh, to be fucked and to fuck is the only freedom left in this country. So that's a very spectacular phrase, isn't it? So in this sense, yes, um, it seems like um, there is a connection between sexual freedom uh, and the lack of uh, political freedom. Um, 
But I'm, I'm interested also in, in how you read Olga, because uh, I think that my reading of this character has changed over time. Because on the one hand, she's a very desperate character. But on the other hand, she's a very strong character that ultimately um, reveals this whole scam, this whole um, um, scheme that... Um, uh, that uh, Sisovsky um, orchestrated, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I wonder in, in your um, reactions to Olga, how, how do you see her as, as readers? Is she a strong character? And I think that I've seen a comment also about a feminist um, reading of the Prague orgy, whether it actually plays uh, into this novella or not. So. Maybe Olga is is the departure point for that discussion. Can we weave feminism? Yeah, yeah I keep thinking of Drenka in Sabbath's Hero, mm -hmm. right. another Eastern European individual woman. Um, although the origin of Drenka, she was not from Eastern Europe. But it's interesting that he transposes the background of Drenka to Eastern Europe. And something about perhaps the power of Eastern women, Eastern European women was something that, that remained with Roth and that he discovered in them an intensity and a force, much like you find in Russian women as represented in Russian literature. And I think that was something that he was both attracted to and I don't want to say repulse, but pushed off by at the same time. The other women in Roth are not like that. Um, but with Olga, with Trenka, we have something forceful, something independent, something strong. Um, and that needs to be thought about, I think. Um, yes. Exactly. I, I agree with that. And I believe that in the end, you know, uh, Olga turns out to be much smarter um streetwise if you will then the zuckerman himself she in the end she she does yeah. know the reality there she's one of those principal reality instructors right it's it's not just uh, rudolf bulotka it's it's also uh, olga i believe um so yes to me she is a yes maybe desperate maybe wretched but at the same time a strong character and i actually quite like how zuckerman is intimidated by her Right, because he yes. is supposed to seduce her, um, the way the character in the aspirin papers is supposed to um, get closer to the niece, right, of the um, mm -hmm. of the of the lover of, of Jeffrey Aspirin, uh, but in the end, no, no, not, nothing comes out of it. It's actually uh, Olga who is all over Zuckerman, and Zuckerman is suddenly like, oh, you know, what am I doing here? <laughs> yes, right. What am I doing here? But, you know, there are other strong women, independent women in Roth. I'm thinking at the conclusion of Portnoy's complaint, the Sabra, who rejects him, kicks him, and he goes back in kind of an abject state. So, yeah, they're there. They're there. But he's both fearful of them, but wants to be with them. I think he wants to, you know, somehow uh, absorb their energy and their power, but he doesn't quite know what to do with it. And it really upsets the Rothian hero, ultimately. And then what does he do with them? He often kills them off, which is what happened to Drenka, right? With cancer. That's so, true. Yeah. That's interesting dynamics, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have a look at the chat. Oh, I like that Olga as a Chekhov performer. Um, well, mm, you're right. Eva Kalinova is the Chekhovian actress, but it's Olga that puts a much bigger show. That's for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's the actress, right? She's the actress in this novella. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Right. Um, I'm reading a comment about um, Vivian Gornick crit criticizing Roth's uh, portrayal of, of women. I think this is an ongoing uh, argument and ongoing criticism. Um, I've always, my stance on that has always been that uh, in many ways, 
the way women are treated in uh, Roth's novels um, demonstrates how dysfunctional his males are. So for me, that's perhaps the direction to go rather than, um, let's say, um, just the criticism, right? Just criticizing Roth for his portrayal of, of, um, of women. I think that Professor Nadel has already problematized uh, the role of strong women um, and the weak ones too in, in, in Roth's fiction. Yeah, so, so for me, this is a, this is a complex, um, yeah, complex argument. Hmm. I'm not sure if I should go sure. into that. <laughs> Maybe not. No. But no, I think the next project for all of us is a collection of essays. And the title of the volume is called Roth and Women. It would be an amazing collection, right? From every point of view. Exactly, um, exactly, yeah. Yes, that's uh, it's an interesting thought, yeah. Could be lively at the very <laughs> least. Definitely, definitely, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I do think that... Roth, of course, if we could say that this is Roth's fault, right? Uh, because he put so much of this useful fiction, his own life into his works. And we know that right. Roth's relationship with women uh, was never easy. And we definitely cannot call him a, a model male, whatever that term means. Uh, but I, I still want to separate the author from the books. I still want to do sure. that. Yeah. Okay. And as a quick addendum, I want to revise the title of this proposed book, Drawing from Ross Last Collection, Why Write? The title of the proposed project should be Roth, Why Women? Exclamant question. That's a great that's a great title. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to have a look at um add some other comments oh john that's that's a super interesting um uh, comment um about your doctoral thesis thank you for sharing if yeah that audio has fun. not had the opportunity to uh share thoughts uh, make comments. If you're able, please unmute. If you are not, we apologize for the technical difficulties, but we are monitoring the chat. Thank you. Oh, there's a comment also about Anna Karenina. <laughs> she was killed off by Tolstoy. Oh. <laughs> Could I say one quick thing? Just sure. one. So <clears throat> over the past year, as I was getting my doctorate in educational leadership, uh, I looked at movies and the connection between movies and creating a better world. So the title of my dissertation is Imagine a Hollywood for the Greater Good. And, um, but in the course of my study, I discovered this film that was lost from 1912 uh, that was called Resurrection based on Leo Tolstoy's third novel about love and social justice. So this movie actually came before the birth of a nation, a literary birth of Hollywood that we never knew. And now I'm on a campaign to educate the world about that. Uh, I only discovered it because the film starred an actress who was in my family, whose name was Blanche Walsh, a great forgotten actress. So also in, in doing this research, I became an autoethnographer. I don't know if people know what that is, it's a kind of a new methodology. It's a qualitative research methodology, which is ethnography plus you tell your story, you talk about yourself. Well, I'm realizing now that Philip Roth may actually have been the first autoethnographer, but he didn't realize it. And, and, and now it's like the hottest new research methodology. Everybody wants to tell their story, but also study culture at the same time. So Philip mm -hmm. Roth as autoethnographer, yeah. That's great. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> what Thanks. is 
Thanks. Wouldn't Ross kind of resist the autobiographical assumption there? I mean, he was always insisting that this isn't this is fiction. This is not autobiography. And then he he goes and writes the facts, right? <laughs> hmm. Well, uh, I think he hid behind his various narrators to construct what is essentially, at least the way I read it, an autobiographical experience, uh, multiple levels and hidden. And with the narrators, he had the freedom to fabricate and also invent elements of his own life. Because what we're finding, if you begin to look very carefully at, say, his statements about various um, moments in his life, he's wrong. And he makes that very point in American Pastoral, right? Getting people wrong is the way you know you're alive and that they are alive. And so I think perhaps the next phase of Roth criticism is pointing out where he was wrong and why he might have created what I'm referring to as the fabrication or invention. And the Zuckerman figure at the end of the facts who writes the critique of the facts is the exposure, you might say, or the beginning of that exposure of what's wrong. And I like that part of the facts a great deal because he corrects and calls out Philip Roth, the author in the facts of mistakes and confusions and the wrong emphasis. And you never did this and you mistreated in your representation that person. So there's a lot here. It's a lot exactly. here. Exactly. He says, stick to fiction because you're much better at it, right? Than writing about the facts. Yes, yeah. That's right. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's fiction. And he accuses him of being what a walking text. Yeah, I like that expression, walking text. <laughs> mm -hmm. Ira, would you like to give any closing comments or anyone else? And then we'll end with Dr. Briwa. The only closing comment I would offer is I think today is another example of the value of our Philip Roth book club and the discoveries that we all make as we hear a presentation, raise certain questions, and most importantly, have a very open discussion. So congratulations again to the Philip Roth Personal Library and to Dale, who's running the show at the moment and how it has allowed this marvelous exchange of views from people who are literally around the world and let's hope it continues. Thank you, Ira, thank you. And we have uh, one comment from Rick, our friend Rick, who was not able to join us in the chat, unfortunately. And he tells me that uh, he and his brothers would cut school and come to the main library, the Newark Public Library. And he and all of you have been invited back to the library. So Rick, we hope to see you. Thank you, thank you. Doctor, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for all your comments. I'm sorry if I, if I uh, have not managed to answer all of your comments. I'm very happy to talk to you um, online. And um, let me just write my uh, email, My um, university email in this chat, okay, if anybody would like to contact me and continue chatting about the Prague orgy. Here it is. And I just wanted to, um, unless there are any, any other questions, any other comments from you, I'd like to uh, share my screen one last time and to finish with a couple of quotations. Absolutely. If you will. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I hope you can see them. So mm -hmm. this is what I talked about before, the unexpected dangers of preconceived ideas and the unexpected pleasures of connecting with the place and its stories. So um, I love these quotations. I love um, particularly the one on the left. So I think I would like to finish with this one if you uh, allow me to read it. So Zuckerman says, and that's during the orgy that we talked about today, 
What a witty, stylish comedy of manners these have-nots of Prague make out of their unbearable condition, of this crushing business of being completely bogged and walking the treadmill of humiliation. They silenced are all mouth. I am only ears and plants. An American gentleman abroad with the bracing, if old-fashioned illusion that he's playing a worthwhile, dignified, and honorable role. We know that Zuckerman's um, mission fails, but I'm sure that I'm com deeply convinced that uh, Philip Roth's mission in Prague did not fail and had enormous influence on um, his own writing and the direction which it took. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your comments. Um, and you, you gave me a lot of food for thought. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. And I'll just read out doctor's email address. It's Martina Brewa at UMA.es. So it's M-A-R-T-Y-N-A-B as in boy, R-Y-L-A at UMA.es because she so uh, generously joined us from Spain. And we, we appreciate you, doctor. Much continued success to you and all thank the work so that you do. Thank you ever so much. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Lauren Wells, Board of Trustees President, our library director, Christian Zabriskie, my colleague who was behind the scenes, Eric Royce, for our tech support. And apologies again to my new friend, Rick, and anyone else who was not able to unmute and will be working on those things. Um, this recording will be available for review on the library's YouTube page soon. And please follow us on, on social media for upcoming events and programs for the spring. And again, if you are ever in the New York City or greater North area, please stop by. Um, we are just within an hour of New York City. Uh, either by private car or by public transportation, and we'd love to see you all. So thank you for your continued support of the Newark Public Library and especially the Philip Roth Personal Library. Thank you and be well. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for sharing this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. That was lovely. Thank that you. That was lovely. So thank much. you. Yes, I think thank you. I think we'll, it went quite well, right? <laughs> yes, it did. Thank you. Okay, we'll be in touch. We'll, I'll be in touch we'll with you next week. Thank you ever thank you so, so much. much. Bye. Good evening.